Hi, we're going to be talking today about Aristotle on essence. I want to talk about the distinction between essential properties and accidental properties, and also think about Aristotle's conception of essence. It's one of the most distinctive aspects of his philosophy. It's something that has been controversial. Aristotelians think of it as fundamental. Asking what the essence of a thing is, or what the essence of a kind is, is for them a basic and absolutely crucial question. Other philosophers have been skeptical of the entire idea of things having essences. And so we'll want to look at the distinction to see if it's well-founded, this distinction between essential and accidental properties, but then also see how we might begin to think about what it is for a thing to have an essence if that distinction is a legitimate distinction. So let's look at this view in Aristotle and the role that it plays in his philosophy. We've asked the question, what is a substance? The most basic of the categories is substance. What is there? Ultimately, the answer is substance. What is substance? Well, we looked at a number of different criteria for being a substance, and we found that nothing really satisfies all the criteria. We considered matter, we considered form, a combination of matter and form in an individual thing. And most intriguingly, really, in book Zeta of the Metaphysics, he talks about essence as possibly what substance is. But that is really never investigated to the same depth as some of the other options. So what would it mean to think of essence as really what substance is? He does think that when we ask a question, what is that? <laughs> well, yes, we specify a substance. We say that is a man, that is a horse, that is a book. But we also, if we're really to press further, and what is a book? Or what is a man? What is a horse? Then we're asking a question about essences. So a deeper answer to that, what is that question, would actually be in terms of essence. Now, what is an essence? Here I've got an old photograph of a candle factory. The candles are being made of wax. They are shaped into a particular shape. It's all pretty much the same shape in the candle. And then they come off a production line. They're good examples of the kind of thing that the Vaisheshika thinkers think requires an individualizer. We have many things that are qualitatively identical, and they're all made of wax, so they all have the same matter. Moreover, they're all of the same form. And so, gosh, same type of matter, same form, um, what makes them different? But that's not the focus of our question today. It's rather, well, what is to be a candle? What is it to be wax, even more fundamentally? Here is how Aristotle puts it at one point. He distinguishes essential from accidental properties. He says things are said to be in an accidental sense and by their own nature. Essential is equated with by their own nature. So here is the basic idea. Things have accidental properties. Without those properties, the thing can remain the same. I can, for example, move over here. I can move over here. I can move around and I'm still me, okay? My particular physical location is something that is accidental to me. Right now I'm in this spot, but I can move into this spot, I can move back, still me. I'm in Austin, Texas right now, but I used to be in Pittsburgh. I can go on vacation to New Hampshire. I can go to Las Vegas, I can go to Costa Rica, I can go to Scotland, still me. And so my location doesn't really matter. What about some other things? Well, I can speak. I can remain silent. Hmm. Still me. <laughs> okay? So remember, a substance is the kind of thing that can have contrary qualities. Those kinds of qualities that a thing might have, might not have, those are accidental qualities, accidental properties of the thing. So without these qualities, without these properties, I can remain who I am. I can remain the same thing. They're contingent, in other words. An object might or might not have these properties. So. I am a certain height right now, for example, but when I was a child, I was much smaller. My height is not essential to me. And my weight is not essential to me. I used to be heavier, now I'm lighter. Um, when I was a child, I was much lighter. That's something that varies, but I still remain the same person. Essential properties, in contrast, are things that, well, without these properties, the thing wouldn't be what it is, okay? Essential properties are necessary to the thing. The thing couldn't lose them without no longer being that thing. And it has them, Aristotle says, by virtue of what it is. So my essential properties are things which are such that without those properties, I would not be who I am or what I am. 
right away we can say, ah, there's a distinction here. Am I saying I wouldn't be Dan Bonavac or I wouldn't be a human being? Well, those are two different questions. We can talk about individual essences, what it is to be Dan Bonavac, but we can also talk about kind essences, of secondary substances, what it is to be a human being. Some properties might be essential to being a human being. Without those, I would not be human. Others might be essential to being me. Without those, I wouldn't be this human being, at least. And so essential properties are necessary to being that particular thing or to being a thing of that kind. And a thing has them by virtue of, well, what it is. That's what makes it essential to that thing. Here is how Aristotle puts it most perspicuously. The essence of each thing is what it is said to be propter se. Well, maybe that's not that perspicuous. Propter se is a Latin phrase, in other words, by virtue of itself. The Greek here is kathauto. Um, the thing is what it is per se, in its own, by its own nature, by virtue of itself. It's not something else making that that thing. It is that by its very nature. I am a human being, let's say, propter se. What does that mean? It means I am a human being by virtue of what I am or who I am, by virtue of me, myself. I am right now a professor by virtue of being employed by the University of Texas, but I am a human being, not by virtue of someone else giving me that position or making me that or turning me into that or something. No, I am that by my very nature. I am that by virtue of myself. Essential properties are like that. So Aristotle gives this example. Being musical, that is not something that is an essential property of a human being. What you are by your essence is what you are by your very nature. But being you is not the same as being musical. You are not by your very nature musical. What you are by your very nature, he says, is your essence. Now, I think of myself as being musical. For 18 years, I sang bass in a chorale. Um, I play the bass guitar in a band. I've played classical organ and piano and harpsichord, even as part of classical groups. Um, and so I think of myself as being pretty musical. I've arranged music, I've composed music. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not by my very nature. Okay? That's something I've learned to do. But if I stop doing music, if I had never done music in the first place, would I not be Dan Bonavac? No, of course not. I'd still be who I am. So being musical or not being musical, that's not something that you have as an essential property. It's not something you have by your very nature. But being human, mm, maybe, now maybe not, but maybe that's something that you have by your very nature. Well, Aristotle characterizes this in a number of different ways. Here is another of the ways. We've talked about an essential property as being necessary to you, as being something you are by your very nature. He also says, this is connected to definitions, the formula in which the term itself is not present, but its meaning expressed. In other words, the definition of the thing. This is the formula of the essence of each thing. So definition is the formula of the essence. What we give in giving a good definition is precisely the essence of a thing. Here I've called the essence as, well, the definition in re, using the Latin term to mean in the thing. It's what the definition expresses in the thing. It is what in the thing corresponds to the definition. The definition is the formula of the essence, which is in the thing or of the thing. So it's something like a definition in the thing. It's what a definition would express. Well, we may be able to define kinds, secondary substances, harder to define an individual substance. And so it becomes controversial for Aristotle whether there truly are essences of individual things, of Dan Bonavac, for example, as opposed to of human being. However that may be, well, we've got to think, hmm, if we don't want to say that an individual thing has an essence, um, we're caught in a little bit of a trap because the essence is precisely what something is. So, it's tempting to say there's an essence only of those things whose formula is a definition. Well, that means we have to have a kind, a species, a genus. In a dictionary, you will find kinds of things. You might find a definition of an accountant or a lawyer or a book, but you're unlikely to find a definition of Dan Bonavac or any particular book, the Iliad and so on. And so it looks as if you're going to say, well, I guess then only secondary substances? 
only those things have essences, but there's no way to talk about the essence of an individual human being? Well, maybe, but that seems really strange. After all, I do sense that there are certain properties that are essential to me. I wouldn't be me without them. And if that's right, then I do have an essence. There are some properties that are truly necessary for being me. Not just being a human being, but being me. Well, what it amounts to here is that Aristotle is giving us several different characterizations of an essential property. The essence of a thing, and here I'll just suppose we're talking about things, but really that X that I've got marked here could be an individual object or it could be a kind. The essence of X is what it is to be X. It is what X is by virtue of itself. It's what X is by its very nature. It's what's expressed by a definition of X. It's a formula for the nature of X. Those are different ways of understanding essential properties. Aristotle gives us all of them. He seems to think they're all equivalent. But as we'll see later in the philosophical tradition, these get separated out into different concepts. What a thing is by its very nature later will be called the nature of the thing. What is expressed by the definition? That John Locke will call the nominal essence of a thing. Um, Aquinas will refer to it as the quiddity of the thing, the whatness of the thing. And so later philosophers draw distinctions and say, wait a minute, Aristotle, these are different concepts. But in Aristotle, they're all introduced as definitions of essential properties, and they're treated as if they're all equivalent. Well, are there definitions of human? One might think so. Aristotle thinks so. He thinks a human being is a rational animal. The genus is animal. A human is a kind of animal. What kind? Well, the kind that is capable of rational activity, rational planning. And so he says, in short, a human being is a rational animal. Can we have definitions of lucky? Well, maybe. It's harder, it seems. If I think about what it is to be lucky, it's to have good fortune, but that just sounds like luck again. And so it's kind of hard to say exactly what lucky amounts to. Um, it seems to be something good happening to you that you didn't really do anything to cause. Perhaps that sort of thing uh, would count as a definition of luck. And then, of course, what about an individual person like me or like Homer Simpson? There is a clip from the Simpsons television show that unfortunately will not play for you today. But it's about Lucky Homer. Lucky Homer in the sense of someone who is sitting there at his panel in the nuclear power plant. A meltdown is about to occur. He can't remember which button to press to stop this from happening, to release the pressure. And so he goes, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and he presses a button with his eyes closed, and it turns out to be the right button. And at first he's a hero for preventing the nuclear accident, and then later it emerges that he did it by luck. People ask him to reenact it, and so he does, and they realize he didn't know what he was doing, he was just lucky. And so the show goes to a little image of Homer as a picture in the dictionary. Definition, lucky, uh, you know, having good fortune, enjoying benefits without having worked for them, and then a little picture of Homer Simpson. And so you might think, yeah, okay. Um, there are things like that in dictionaries where, in a sense, they don't know how to give you a definition. They show you a little picture. And maybe some things are really like that. We don't know how to explain them. In any case, it looks like if we tie this closely to definition, we're going to have problems with individuals like me or Homer Simpson. We're going to have difficulty maybe with some very basic concepts. What is it for something to be on something else, like the book to be on my hand. Well, maybe it's pretty hard to give a definition of that. Maybe contacting them with one uh, above it in space. It's possible, perhaps, but there might be things like that that are really basic that we don't know how to define. In any case, do we want to deny those things as having essences, or do we want to say, well, we shift to something else? It's what that is by its very nature, a spatial relation, for example, in the case of on. That remains to be seen. If we think about essences, we do have to be careful. Are we talking about essences of kinds, the properties necessary for being a thing of that kind? The things of that kind maybe are, by their very nature, as elements of that kind or instances of that kind. And then we've got to talk about essences of individuals, perhaps, the properties necessary for being that individual, for being me as opposed to being a human being. 
Aristotle considers the question, does an individual human being, like Socrates for example, have an essence? What is Socrates by virtue of himself? What is Socrates by his very nature? What's included in a definition of Socrates? And is there even a definition of Socrates? What's necessary for being Socrates? Now notice that the way we might actually define Socrates if we're trying to explain to somebody who Socrates is, saying, oh, he was Plato's teacher, he is the person who really first began to ask hard questions of people, demanding that they justify uh, their positions in philosophy by giving definitions of terms and so forth. Well, all of that is accidental to Socrates. It could be that Socrates never began asking philosophical questions, that he died as a child, for example. It could be that he never taught Plato, that Plato never met Socrates but lived somewhere else. So in short, none of those things seem to be necessary for being Socrates. Maybe being human is necessary, but then again, maybe not. Could a wicked witch turn him into a frog, for example? Well, if so, then actually being human is not essential to Socrates. Um, what is he by his very nature? Aristotle ends up considering this question, saying, well, in one sense, Socrates has an essence, an individual essence of this kind. There are things that are necessary to being Socrates. In another sense, not really, because we can't really give you a definition of Socrates. But let's think for a moment and imagine that we can. Let's take me, for example, here I am at a blackboard giving a lecture, and ask about my accidental properties. That day I was wearing a white shirt. Today I'm wearing a blue shirt. That shows that wearing a shirt of a particular color is not an essential property of mine. Same professor, different color shirts. The shirt of a color, well, hey, that's an accidental property of mine. There I'm writing on the blackboard. Here I'm not. Again. Accidental property, writing on blackboard or not writing on blackboard. However, there are certain properties we do have in common. He and I are both human beings. He and I are both Dan Bodovac. And indeed, one answer is just to say the essence of Dan Bodovac is Dan Bodovac. That's what Aristotle actually ends up saying. You want the best answer to what the essence of Socrates is? It's Socrates. It's just being Socrates. And so there's nothing more to say. If we think, what are my essential properties? another photograph of me teaching at an earlier time, we could say, well, okay, hmm, again, I'm wearing a shirt, different shirt this time, I'm wearing a tie there, not wearing a tie today. Those things are accidental to me, but what kinds of properties are essential to me? Maybe being a human being, maybe having a soul, maybe being located in space and time, Maybe having the particular parents I had, or having the particular genetic structure I have. Maybe it's something about personality, being a certain kind of person. Maybe it's something about my particular history. There might be all sorts of things that are essential to me, but it's hard to say what they are, and indeed philosophers disagree about that. Some are going to say it's a matter of being born of those parents, having that genetic pattern. Others are going to say, no, it's a matter of consciousness or personality. Still others will say there's an immaterial soul. Others will say, no, you're really an animal. Being a human being is essential to you. So all of those are possible answers, and to some extent conflicting answers, for what is really essential to being me or any other particular human being. Kinds seem a bit easier. So here's a definition, for example, of a foreword. It's something like a preface, an introduction to a book. The foreword, that's something we can give a definition of. There is an essence of that. If I say, look, aha, go to the last page of the book, you can read the foreword. You want to say, I, I'm, no, 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 the, the foreword doesn't appear on the last page, it appears up at the beginning. It is the foreword, the thing that comes before. It's the introduction, the preface. It's not the thing that is the conclusion at the end. And so being essential to being a foreword is, well, to be written at or near the beginning, to be the start of things, introducing things. Or what about this? What is it to be a dignitary? It might be very hard and very controversial to say what it is to be a human being, much less, and well, even more so, what it is to be Dan Bonovac or Socrates, but what is it to be a dignitary? The dictionary gives us the definition. One who has an exalted rank or holds a position of dignity or honor. A dignitary is such a person of high rank, of, of honor. Uh, that's something that is the essence of that. If I say, well, here's somebody but who 
is, you know, at the absolute lowest ranks of society and nobody respects them, well, they don't count as a dignitary. Now, that's not to say they don't have a kind of dignity. They may well have dignity. Indeed, Immanuel Kant says every human being has a dignity just by virtue of being human. Dignity is essential to us. But having a high rank in a social hierarchy, that's not something that is essential to any particular person. It is, however, necessary to being a dignitary. So I may be somebody who has a high rank or not, and so count as a dignitary for a time or not. But on the other hand, I don't have that. Nobody has that kind of property essentially. But having dignity as a human being, maybe every human being has that essentially. Well, does dignitary have an essence then? We'd be asking questions like this. What are dignitaries? Notice not just by virtue of who they are or what they are, by virtue of being dignitaries. What's a dignitary? By very nature of being a dignitary. What's included in the definition of dignitary? What's necessary for being a dignitary? Answer is something like a position of high rank or a position of respect or honor. Natural kinds pose more difficult questions. So what is the essence of water? What is it to be water? What is water by its very nature? Or gold? What is gold by its very nature? What is necessary to being gold? Those questions are a bit deeper, and they seem to call not for looking at a dictionary for some kind of verbal explanation, but instead they call for scientific investigation. We could ask what it is to be wheat, what is essential to being wheat, or to being wax. And that is a different sort of question. We can give a dictionary definition of wax, but we can also give a scientific definition. Aristotle doesn't draw the distinction. However, later in the philosophical tradition, those things are distinguished. And when we get to John Locke, he will say, look, there are two completely different conceptions of what an essence is. One is a scientific sort of question of what that thing is by its very nature. Another is a more linguistic question about what that thing is by virtue of being called a thing of that kind, by virtue of the definition, which is a purely verbal or linguistic matter. So the essence of water, to take that example, it's what it is to be water, what water is by virtue of itself, what it is by its very nature, what's expressed by a definition of water, what's necessary to being water. Well, if we're asked that in the contemporary setting, we're inclined to say, oh, I know, it's being H2O. But earlier, in Aristotle's time, people had no idea what the chemical elements were. They couldn't have said, ah, water is H2O. They would have given a really different answer and not looked to a scientific theory for that answer at all. There is something Aristotle and we would have in common, though, because we are asking about the properties essential, that is to say, necessary to being water, what water is by virtue of itself, what it is just by virtue of being water. And whatever the best way of answering that question is, that's something that does seem essential to drawing the distinction between essential and accidental properties.